a heat wave. Oh my. And now wow. we're getting the rain. <laughs> oh geez. You know, I, was gonna, I was wondering about the weather, what it's like over there, because everybody always says, oh, London fog. And I'm like, London's got more than fog. It's <laughs> it's actually um, currently, I can look at my watch, currently it's 75 degrees and it's 11 o'clock at night. Well, that's pretty good because it's about uh, 66 here. So that's, you know, we're fairly mild like that. We're almost even. So that's pretty yeah, good. but it's, it's late night. <laughs> True. That's true. That's the point. It's almost 11 there. So. Yes. <laughs> okay. It looks like we're starting to get people in. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. So thanks for everybody to join us. Welcome to the Hudson Library and Historical Society. Uh, before we get started, a couple little things. I'm Derek. I'm one of the reference librarians here. Uh, two programs you may find interesting. Uh, they're both going to be via Zoom. Sunday, September 12th, 2 p.m., we have New York Times bestselling author, Anne Cleves, and she's gonna talk about The Heron's Cry, her newest book. Mary Roach is gonna join us Monday, September 20th at 7 p.m. And she's gonna talk about her book, Fuzz, When Nature Breaks the Law. So visit our website, hudsonlibrary.org for more of those wonderful programs. So we'd like to thank the Learned Owl for providing copies of your book tonight. And it's gonna be on the right-hand side. There'll be a link there and you can click on that and buy this book. Speaking of the chat room that we talked about on the right hand side, as well as at the bottom, there's a Q&A. We will have time for questions. So go ahead and please give us some questions and we'll give them to the author. So speaking of the author, tonight we have with us live, we have Susan Ronald. She's going to be talking about her newest book, The Ambassador, Joseph Kennedy and the Court of St. James. And she's coming from us again from England. And she's originally born in LA in California. And she's a historian and author. And she's worked for an advisor to the British government, including England's National Trust. And she's written numerous books, such as A Dangerous Woman, Hitler's Art Thief, Heretic Queen, The Pirate Queen, and Shakespeare Daughter. And she's coming from us live from England. So thank you and it's over to you. Thank you, Derek. Thank you very much. I'm going to try and do my screen share bit and it is coming up, so I'm not going to panic. Thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Um, <clears throat> this uh, is a book that's been a long time in gestation, I have to say. Um, I have been thinking about writing it for probably 10 years. Um, I've always been fascinated by the Kennedy family, but I've been wondering why nobody had ever written about Joe as ambassador to Britain. And because I've lived in Britain for um, almost 30 years now, and because I'm also American as well as British, I just thought that it was a fascinating story to tell. So hopefully you're going to agree with me by the end of this, okay? This is a bit of shameless publicity I'm giving you. Um, these are some of my other books. Uh, thank you, Derek, for having mentioned it before. Um, but these are my last three books. And oddly enough, it was when I wrote Condé Nast, which was the last book before this, that I decided I really do have to write Joe. Condé Nast was a really wonderful guy, very powerful, um, was a friend of Joe's. Um, and I saw a different side to Joe Kennedy than I had seen before. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna write about Joe as ambassador. Obviously, uh, I'm sure all of you know that Joe Kennedy had nine children um, and he saw a, a great deal of misfortune with those nine children during his lifetime. Uh, his eldest son, Joe Jr., was killed in uh, World War II, and Jack as well nearly died then. But of course, he saw two of his sons, he was still alive to see two of his sons assassinated, and he was alive when um, the terrible uh, death of uh, Mary Jo Kopechny took place um, at Chappaquiddick. So he, he'd seen quite a lot of bad things um, with his children. Joe Kennedy was actually a second generation American. His father was uh, Patrick Joseph Kennedy, and he was a Ward II boss uh, in Boston, in East Boston. And when I say a Ward II boss, the wards were really, really important in local politics. And if anybody would like to find out more about what it was like to live back at the turn of the previous century um, in Boston, uh, in particular, you should read Edwin O'Connor's The Last Hurrah. 
Um, there was also a film starring Spencer Tracy about it. Um, but basically, these were the guys that um, they were sort of a shadow government. They dispensed a wealth and largesse to all of the people who would vote the way they told them to vote. He was also a saloon keeper. This gentleman here is Honey Fitz Fitzgerald, or John Fitzgerald, who was Rose's father, Rose Kennedy's father. And he looked down on um, Patrick Kennedy. He thought that, you know, he was a saloon keeper. He didn't have class. He didn't have clout, which he did have. And he was very much against Joe marrying his eldest daughter, Rose. Oops, sorry. Until... Patrick Kennedy decided that he would make Joe the youngest bank president in America. Never mind that it was Pat's bank. Never mind that it was Joe's friends who were investing in it. And once he'd become the youngest bank president in America, finally, Honey Fitz agreed that Rose could marry Joe. So in October 1914, they became man and wife. And Rose Im almost immediately decided that uh, started to have children. One of the things that um, Honey Fitz also did was he gifted Joe his personal secretary, a man here called Eddie Moore. This is this picture comes from um, 1939. It's Eddie and his wife Mary, who were effectively surrogate parents to all of the children. But Eddie was also also became Joe's most important uh, private confidant in business. He knew where all of the skeletons were buried. Okay. Joe's first two sons, Joe Jr. on the left and uh, Jack Kennedy or JFK on the right. Jack was born in 19, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 1917, just when America decided to go to war against um, Germany on the side of the Allies, France and uh, Great Britain. But Joe didn't want to serve in the war. And he turned to Honey Fitz and said, look, I need a reserved occupation. I can't possibly, I've got two sons. My wife is pregnant with, uh, with a third child. There's no way that I can absolutely serve in the US Army. And so he had a reserve uh, occupation as a manager, not the manager, but a manager at the Four River Shipyard. Um, previous biographers have told another story. I was very lucky that somebody had done um, their PhD on Joe during this period. And I discovered that everything that Joe had said afterwards had actually been a bold lie. Um, he had been put in charge of the shipyard through a whole catalog of errors and, and made many, many mistakes to the point where the assistant secretary of the Navy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Charles Schwab, who's the head of Bethlehem Steel that owned the shipyard, had to step in and sort out Joe's mess. I think Joe learned from the experience, but he always claimed that there had been other reasons why um, his time at Four River hadn't been uh, as much of a success as it should have been. After the war, Joe became um, a stockbroker with Hayden Stone, originally in Boston, and then he moved down to Wall Street. And this is the period, you know, 1920, 22, where you really is in the height of the rugged individualist in America. There were virtually no laws on Wall Street, uh, which of course makes things um, uh, a bit like the Wild West, I suppose. Uh, and Joe made his first millions uh, at that point in time. He bought the home that the children grew up in, in Bronxville, New York. Um, it's since been torn down, I've, I've been told. Um, but that was the family home for many years before they went to, uh, to Britain in 1938. 1927, Joe cashes out of Wall Street, makes him look actually quite intelligent, and decides he's going to go to Hollywood as a producer. Now, you know, he knew nothing about making films. Joe was incredibly numerate. He understood the flow of money. He was very, very clever in how to invest it and use it. But more importantly of all, he spotted timing on opportunities. And this is where he made his second fortune. He had bought a very small uh, distribution company called uh, the uh, <clears throat> Film Booking Offices, which had been a British company, and turned it into one of the big 
uh, powerhouses in uh, Hollywood, uh, eventually it would become the impetus for Joe to um, uh, do a merger with RKO and Pathé, which made him many more millions of dollars. He also decided to embark on a love affair with Gloria Swanson, who was at the time the highest paid film star in Hollywood. Uh, I, sorry, skipped. That lasted for about two years, three years. Um, and when they were making this picture, What a Widow, Gloria um, asked Joe why he had charged a brand new Cadillac to the writer of this picture. And Joe was deeply offended and he literally got up, walked out of the room and Gloria never heard from him again. He left Hollywood and went back to New York. And this is what he found in New York. This is a picture of Central Park right after the crash, the uh, Wall Street crash. Um, Hoovervilles were everywhere across America, but this is a pretty stark picture of what it was like to walk through Central Park in um, 1930. But Joe wasn't concerned with that. He was still concerned with making money, making his mark. He had had this dream ever since uh, Joe Jr. was born, along with Honey Fitz and his father, that he or his sons would become the first Catholic president of America. And he was putting all of his money behind Joe Jr. for that. Here he's at Palm Beach, and he is now in the process of becoming an important donor to the um, Democratic Party. And he's also getting money from Republicans who would like to see Roosevelt handle the problems that had, had come up during the, um, uh, the Wall Street crash and afterwards. So this is Elliot Roosevelt and he and Joe, Joe t convinces him, Elliot, you're gonna make a fortune. We're gonna go into the scotch business when your father repeals the Prohibition Act. Now, Joe went across to Europe with Elliot and of course, he was able to wipe the floor with all of the competition because here he is with the president-elect's son at the time when um, they're going to be uh, repealing the laws. Um, he put Elliot in a very bad position and also put Roosevelt in a bad position. It was something that Roosevelt would not forget. Joe had wanted to become secretary of the treasury, but instead he became the uh, head of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, he was a good administrator, but by the same token, he was really upset that he hadn't been named Secretary of the Treasury. And Roosevelt actually said, I'm not going to make him Secretary of the Treasury because I won't be able to control him. So Joe used that position. He was in it for just under two years. And by now, Roosevelt understood Joe sticks at things for about two years before he gets tired. Um, and Joe was using that position to further his own image and the image of the family throughout America. And he was actually quite famous as America's most astute businessman, because, of course, he's one, one of the few who didn't lose his money in the crash. He quits in 1935 and tells Roosevelt, I'll still consider myself a member of your administration. And Roosevelt says, well, I'll tell you what. Um, Basically, I have a problem with the World War I debts. If they're repaid, it would really help us on our road to recovery. So Joe, while you're in Europe with your family, could you do me a favor and go to Berlin and Rome and Paris and London and try and see if you're gonna be able to get these countries to repay the war debt? So he goes to Berlin, um, he's unable to get anywhere uh, through Ambassador Dodd, doesn't meet with anyone important. In Rome, he learns that um, the Vatican doesn't want to do anything political um, and he shouldn't be getting involved with them. It uh, doesn't meet with Mussolini. And Paris, well, Paris, the, the French government was in total disarray at this time. There were like nine prime ministers within a two year period. But when he gets to London and he meets with Ambassador uh, Robert Worth Bingham, who Kennedy referred to as Robert Worthless Bingham, who was from Kentucky, by the way, um, he realized that actually a good way for him to create a political profile for himself and to create a platform for his boys is to become ambassador to London. Now, why London? Well, first of all, he didn't speak any foreign languages, 
But also he knew that Bingham was very ill uh, with some undiagnosed disease. And he was able to commiserate with Bingham because of course, Jack had been ill throughout his childhood and actually was put back two years at school because he had been ill for so many, uh, for such a prolonged period of time. They didn't know until 1947 that he suffered from Addison's disease. So he comes back in uh, the autumn of 1936 from Europe and he says, right, I'm going to write a pamphlet for the 36th election. Sorry, autumn of 35, I'm going to write a pamphlet for the 36th election. I'm for Roosevelt. I'm going to get businessmen to stop hating Roosevelt and I'm going to get him the Catholic vote. So he turns first to um, Rose's confessor, who was at the time Bishop Spellman, um, Bishop Francis Spellman. He became Cardinal Spellman later on. And with him and with Spellman on his side and all of his connections back to the Vatican, because Spellman had spent most of his youth there, he was, Joe was able to bring across to America Cardinal Pacelli, pictured in the middle below, who ended up becoming Pius XII. Um, you've got Joe on the left, and you have uh, Pacelli's senior advisor, Enrico Galeazzi. Now, what's interesting about this is that he, Joe had wanted Pacelli to meet with Roosevelt prior to the election. Pacelli refused. Joe couldn't understand why. The main reason is that Pacelli is the one that had gone around Europe signing all of these agreements with major countries, including Germany, to um, agree to the protection of Europe's Catholics against fascism and against communism. Um, he'd signed his agreement with Mussolini back in 1929 and actually was able to pocket millions for the Vatican as a result. But he, his, his one thing that was quite clear is he was not allowed to get involved in politics. So this is probably the last time you'll ever see America almost all blue. The 1936 election was an enormous uh, landslide. Um, only Maine and Vermont had voted for Landon as Republican candidates. I thought you'd like to see that. Um, but anyway, we'll go on from there. Um, Joe, again, is trying to become the uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, is, is a dear friend of Roosevelt's and he's doing a very good job in incredibly difficult times. And Joe is given a job beneath his capabilities as the first maritime commissioner. Um, and he needs to settle some 400 odd postal contracts and only has 71 days to do it because basically the postal contracts um, were and had ended up defrauding um, the American government. So while Joe is doing this in the 71 days, he's also trying to buy William Randolph Hearst's companies because Hearst is now in big trouble. Uh, how the man can juggle these sorts of things was, was totally beyond me, but I think it's, it's an interesting story and insight into him. And at the same time, he's starting to militate to become ambassador to Great Britain. He has the, uh, this picture taken shortly after the election um, and in 1936, because he knows that he's going to, as soon as Bingham is going to retire, he's going to force Roosevelt to make him ambassador. And why, okay? Here's Joe Jr. He's gonna graduate from Harvard in 1938. He studied government. He's been told you're going to be the first Catholic president of the United States. Joe Jr. had made the Spanish Civil War his main focus in his government studies. We have Jack, who's, uh, who's entering Harvard in his first year. Uh, and he, he basically, in 1938, is going to be a freshman at Harvard. He really wants to um, put Jack on, uh, in into the thick of things as well. In the summer of 1937 though, Jack heads off to Europe with his good friend, Lem Billings, who's pictured below with Rose. Um, and the letters back from Europe are actually quite incredible. Uh, when you compare Joe Jr.'s letters to Jack's letters, Jack is the one who's obviously a reader. He's obviously the guy who loves history. He doesn't listen to what newspapers are saying or people are saying in the street. He actually is trying to understand 
what all of these new isms are, the communism, the Bolshevism, all, all of the things. What is fascism? How is it different from Nazism? And, and he's really quite erudite, um, surprisingly for, for somebody uh, so young. Um, whereas Joe repeats things that have been in the press, Joe Jr. rather, things that have been in the press and not particularly um, original. Um, I think I call it sophomoric in, in, in the book. So Bingham is very ill. He comes back to America in the fall of 1937. And Joe enlists the help of the gentleman above, whose name is Arthur Croc. Um, Croc was the Washington bureau chief for the New York Times. He had been on Joe's payroll for well over a year. Um, I am 100% certain that he never told the New York Times or anybody else that he had been paid secretly by Joe and that he'd also had quite a few perks in foreign holidays and time down in, in um, uh, Palm Beach at the Kennedy home. And so he and Joe cooked up a plan that would eventually force Roosevelt into making him ambassador. Bingham had said that he wanted Tom Watson of IBM, which wouldn't have been a better choice by the way. Um, but on December 7th, 1937, um, Croc decided that he would go public. Joe Kennedy was going to be the next ambassador. Now, Roosevelt was furious. He said, all he's interested in doing is promoting his boys and his family, which was true, but he had no choice. And eventually, and this is part of the big story in the book, for um, the next two months, Joe doesn't come to Britain. Bingham has died in December. Roosevelt blames Joe for his, his premature death, which I think is wrong. Um, and Joe's only sworn in on the 18th of February, um, 1938. The question is, why the delay? And that's quite a big point in the book, why the delay? Um, I don't have a conclusive answer, but I think I understand it. He only arrives in Britain on the 1st of March, 1938. Um, for those of you who don't have your European history just to hand, on the 12th of March, Germany wa waltzed into Austria. Um, and took over the country. So he's in the country literally for 12 days before the first major step towards World War II occurs. Now, this is a picture of Joe on the 8th of March, and there's the London fog, um, with his entourage as he's about to present his credentials to King George VI. The gentleman who's second from the left is um, Colonel Raymond Lee, who uh, is the military attache to the US Embassy. And Raymond Lee had the best um, saying about Joe Kennedy that I, of anybody I ever heard. And he said, the problem with Joe Kennedy isn't that he's, he's not smart, he's smart, but he's drunk on his own verbosity. Kennedy did not know when to keep his own counsel. He did not know when to basically be quiet. And he said and did things that were deeply offensive to the president and to the State Department. Somebody else who was like Joe um, was Randolph Churchill, son of Winston. And within the first week that he was in the UK, the two of them were sparring at a lunch one day and they got um, Winston Churchill so angry and so upset, he literally turned purple and berated Joe for everything that he was saying about um, how Britain had to roll over and let Germany take over the rest of Europe. So uh, within the first week, he has Churchill upset. That's not such a big deal because Churchill hadn't been in government for 10 years, but it would become a big deal. The two people who really mattered, who he had angered, not even upset, was Secretary of State Cordell Hull, who was the longest serving Secretary of State in America, um, and Sumner Wells, who was his assistant. Uh, Sumner Wells had more time for Joe. He was quite um, forgiving of a lot of Joe's um, ways of, of handling things. But uh, Cordell Hull, by the 17th of March, had decided that Kennedy was a, a, 
complete waste of space. He was just, he was so angry. He didn't even want to deal with him anymore. So Joe's been in, in, in the country 16 days and he's already upset the State Department. And why? Because he's telling Cordell Hull and also Sumner Wells and others within the State Department that Enrico Galeazzi understands things in Europe much better than you do. And you should be taking the Vatican's advice on why it's not such a big deal that Germany has overrun Austria. That didn't go down too well. He also is telling the State Department and the president, Neville Chamberlain, who's the prime minister at the time, is a great guy. He's got everything under control. His theory on appeasement is the thing that makes everything work. Um, you guys just don't know what you're talking about. And Joe, within, literally within the first month of coming to, to Britain, is beginning to surround himself with people to set up what I call a little White House in London. And he's not paying attention to either the president or the State Department. Joe hates um, Anthony Eden. He suffers, uh, who's pictured above, who had been the foreign minister before, just before he arrived. Anthony Eden was replaced by Lord Halifax, who had helped refine the appeasement um, theories with Chamberlain and was, was devoted to trying to do something to keep Hitler within, um, I, I suppose, relatively human bounds. However, um, on the 11th of March, this is, so Joe's in the country 10 days, he meets with Joachim von Ribbentrop at the German embassy in London, pictured above, because Ribbentrop had been the ambassador and had passed the mantle over to his successor, the gentleman below, um, who's uh, not exactly the most um, friendly looking chap, uh, Herbert von uh, Dixon, sorry, Herbert von Dirksen, who um, had been known in the 1920s as the enemy of Poland. Von Dirksen was a seasoned diplomat. He had just come from um, a few years in Tokyo as well. He knew what the German plan was for war. And between him and Ribbentrop, they decided that they would befriend Kennedy. And by June of 1938, Kennedy was revealing secrets on how he felt things should be handled with Germany and how if he could possibly go and meet Hitler, everything would be sorted out and America wouldn't enter the war. But back in March, 10 days after he's there, he's telling Ribbentrop, don't worry, America's not gonna go into any more foreign wars. This was a big mistake. So this is the 11th of March, 1938 in Austria and in, in uh, Vienna. Uh, it is decided not to go to war with Hitler by Chamberlain. He convinces Parliament that these are two German speaking nations that want to be united. And there was a certain amount of truth in that. But obviously, it was ignoring the fact that there were now hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing um, and fleeing for their lives and creating a, a, human, a human outpouring of misery. Churchill uh, had been on his soapbox since 1932 about the Nazis, and now he's really beginning to make headway um, that this is that the Anschluss, the reunification of Germany with Austria, is only the beginning. Meanwhile, Joe is enjoying himself in high society. The, he and Rose are invited to Windsor Castle in April. Uh, to meet the king and queen. He begins to talk to the king, uh, very unfortunately, about some um, uh, nuns who had been caught in the Spanish Civil War and how it was more important to get these nuns out. There are other refugees besides Jews. And, he, and he's doing this at a social event, which was a tremendous faux pas and breach of etiquette, also a breach of protocol. <laughs> they were having a ball. This is uh, them with the Duke of Kent at the 4th of July celebrations. I just thought you'd like to see him. And Rose that May was able to present two of her daughters, Rosemary on the right and Kick or Kathleen on the left uh, at court. 
Um, Joe, there's a, quite a lot in the book about how Joe was going to stop uh, American debutantes from being um, uh, presented at court in Britain. Um, and this is all about making his daughter shine um, as well. They became very friendly with the uh, Astors, Nancy and Waldorf Astor, um, obviously who also had American connections um, and sp spent a great deal of time at their country home, Clifton, which is pictured above. And it's through Nancy Astor that Kick met uh, Jane Ogilvie. And we've got Kick below with Jane standing next to her cousin, Billy Hartington, who became the love of Kick's life and, and she also became the love of his life. Meanwhile, Halifax has decided we've got to do something to stop Germany. Epismian isn't working. And he starts working secretly with, with Churchill, which I thought was, was quite interesting and a little known fact. Um, and But the Kennedys, are, in the words of Roosevelt, are just having a whale of a time. They're not really getting involved in reporting back diligently to the, to the president or the State Department what's really happening between Britain and the rest of Europe. In May, um, shortly after the girls were uh, presented at court, uh, Claire Booth Luce comes across with her husband, Henry, and um, Joe and Claire embark on an on again, off again love affair. And she becomes a major advisor to Joe Kennedy about what he should be doing and how he should be running for president in 1940. And of course, Joe's tremendously flattered as well. He goes back on Claire's um, advice to uh, see his son, Joe Jr. theoretically graduate from Harvard that June. But in fact, he ends up having Croc, Arthur Crock of the New York Times plant a series of articles about how he knows all about Europe and he's going to tell the president and the State Department what they have to do. Roosevelt is so angry, he tries to, he basically kicks him out and, and everything is really, really bad for him. He doesn't actually go to the graduation. When he gets back, he claims that um, the trade agreement that the United States and Great Britain, don't forget at this time, is still the British Empire, so it represents a, a greater part of the world than it would today, um, were, was not going anywhere. And that's because it was summer and, it, and everybody was going on holiday. Well, he wasn't pulling the wool over anybody's eyes. Roosevelt had known, as did uh, Sumner Wells, certainly, that uh, Joe had already booked a villa at Antibes for the family for the summer. And the reason for that was because he was trying to avoid Billy Hartington proposing to kick. Um, and if she wasn't going to be around for Billy's 21st birthday party, then there was no way that he would be able to propose. And so he took the entire family off. Jack knew about the proposal and he tried to get his parents to listen. But of course, Billy was Protestant and that went against everything that the Catholic Kennedys believed in. And this is a picture of them at Antibes at the time. Um, the, the family were all there. They were all enjoying themselves. And Joe started shooting off his mouth. He was saying things about um, Henry Morgenthau being too old, about uh, Sumner Wells being uh, gay, which he shouldn't have been doing at all at that time. And then also uh, that he was crit critical of um, Cordell Hull. So things were really not going well. And his next door neighbors, the Windsors, who had already had their fair share of problems, heard about this and told um, the British uh, government. Also in uh, Antibes at the time was uh, Marlena Dietrich and Joe now begins an affair with her. It's just a summer affair, um, but the next summer when she's there again with him, they're no longer lovers, but she was his lover then. And it was Marlena's daughter pictured here behind Marlena, um, Maria Riva, who writes about the affair in a really funny uh, way in her biography about her mother. Um, it's, it's quite worthwhile. And I do quote her about the Kennedy children who she absolutely adored. So we're now in September, 1938. 
Joe was still in Antibes having his affair with Marlena and the Czech crisis begins. He, he comes back via Paris to a meeting that he hadn't been invited to. He starts putting in his two penny worth about how you should let Hitler have um, whatever he wants from the Ch uh, Czechoslovakia. And of course, this, this becomes the big crisis. Um, and Kennedy then says to Roosevelt, this is, this is true. I mean, look at this. This, is, this man is going to save the world. It's not you, President Roosevelt, and it's not, not anybody else. It's going to be um, Chamberlain, which upsets Roosevelt, to put it mildly. And he portrays Chamberlain to the State Department and to Roosevelt as the savior of the world. At the end of September, after some very fraught negotiations, uh, which did not include the Czech government, um, he comes back, Chamberlain comes back from uh, Munich, waving his little piece of paper, saying, uh, this is peace for our time. And at that point in time, Halifax, who had backed up Chamberlain throughout, shivered. He was so upset. He knew that it was over. He knew that there was going to be war. But Chamberlain and Kennedy did not. This is, I thought you'd be interested in seeing this um, political cartoon at the time from the London Times, uh, basically saying this, the leaders of democracy were spineless and Hitler was just going to keep doing what Hitler did. Two months after uh, Munich, we have Kristallnacht, where anything Jewish was destroyed. All of the synagogues in Germany were destroyed. The number of uh, refugees uh, increased manifold times. Um, and Joe Kennedy knew everything that there was to know about the refugee crisis. He had tried to become the head of the, the Intergovernmental Refugee Committee and failed. And he was very angry with Roosevelt for not allowing that. And that committee actually had its offices in London at the American embassy and frequently, Joe was found in there, rifling through their papers, trying to figure out what he could reveal that they hadn't revealed as yet. And he'd, he'd actually gotten them very upset and angry. He goes back to America for um, the Christmas holidays. Rose takes the children off to Switzerland and Saint Moritz, where that picture at the beginning had been taken. And only comes back. So he's gone from December, all of December, all of January, and he only comes back in February when um, the Pope has died and Pope Pius XII, his friend Pacelli, is going to be named Pope. He asks Roosevelt if he can be the US representative um, to the coronation and Roosevelt agrees. And here's Joe and Rose with um, Galeazzi, who, as I mentioned before, is a fascist, okay, um, celebrating the coronation. And here's a picture of all the kids, except for uh, Joe Jr., who had been stuck in Spain at the time. And um, it's, it's interesting because there were two seats allotted, and not only did Joe come with the entire family, but he also came with all of the secretaries and the, and the nannies and all sorts of other people and created quite a furore. Um, and there's, there's a comical thing about uh, Pope John Paul and what he'd had to say about it. This is obviously long before he became Pope. Oops, sorry. So March, 1939, guess what happens? Yep, Germany's on the move again and it takes over the rump of Czechoslovakia. Joe didn't care. He thought Britain should just do what it wanted to do. Here's Hitler and Prague. And the only comment Joe makes at the time is about Eunice being presented at court. Uh, she starred at the uh, biggest party of the year, which took place at Blenheim Palace, um, which is, of course, now uh, a, um, a World Heritage Site uh, near Oxford. I just thought you'd like the picture. But meanwhile, what's happened in June is the King and Queen of England have gone to America. And for, for a few days, they meet with the Roosevelt's at Hyde Park. And FDR tells George VI, we, we have other channels to speak. We can speak direct. I don't want you to be using Kennedy. He's not giving my message clearly. 
and it is clearly understood between the two uh, two men that um, Kennedy is to be sidelined. Kennedy, meanwhile, decides that he's going to start making people understand you can't go to war against Germany. You've got to let Hitler have his head. And he enlists the help of Charles Lindbergh, who was also a fascist sympathizer at the time, along with Henry Ford and a lot of other Americans. And so basically, um, he puts forward a paper saying, if you fight against Germany, you're going to lose no matter what. And he starts this defeatist talk, which is now beginning to get the Brits quite upset. Lindbergh says, it's Roosevelt, not Hitler, that the world should fear. He thought that Roosevelt was a dangerous man and he would drag America into an unnecessary war. And while they're doing this, um, Ribbentrop manages to seal an agreement with, with uh, Stalin, which is called the Molotov-Ribbentrop Agreement, and they agree to be allies for the carve-up of Poland. On September the 1st, Germany inv invades Poland. Two days later, Britain declares war on behalf of France and Britain against Germany. This is 1939. Joe returns to America, claiming his stomach is too bad. He can't continue. He can't do all these things. Everybody's shouting at him. Nobody likes him. Um, and he actually, the only medical paper you find in the Kennedy archive is uh, Joe's doctor writing to President Roosevelt saying he needs to recover and have lots of R&R &R and his home in Palm Beach, and he may or may not return to England. Great, wonderful. So what happens? Roosevelt decides he's going to send Sumner Wells on a fact-finding trip. He's not getting any joy out of Kennedy. He's also sidelined Kennedy completely. And so here we have a picture of Sumner Wells in London talking to Chamberlain, looking at Chamberlain. You've got the six foot five tall um, uh, Halifax on the left. And Joe's decided, well, actually, if I, if I cut out now, there's no way I'm going to be president in 1940 or vice president. So I've got to do something about it. And what he does is he shadows Wells all around Europe to try and make sure that he can control things. Um, there's a wonderful quote from George VI in his diary about how disappointed he is that he can't speak to Wells without Kennedy being present. April 1940, of course, a month after, well, it's actually weeks after um, uh, he leaves, uh, sorry, Sumner Wells leaves we have the invasion of uh, Denmark and Norway. And the result of that is that there was a vote of no confidence in parliament and Chamberlain basically is forced to resign. He wanted Halifax to take over. Halifax said, I'm not the man to lead this country in war. There's only one man who can do that. And of course, as we all know, Churchill did that. He kept on Halifax as his um, foreign, uh, foreign secretary for quite some time. But when um, the British ambassador to the United States died unexpectedly in December, Halifax ended up replacing him as ambassador to the US. July 1940, the Blitz starts. I think everybody knows that story. Kennedy is not allowed to leave London. His family's gone back to America. Roosevelt says, you cannot leave London. And he's forced to stay during all of the problems. He does not go once to any of the bombed out areas. Yeah, he buys an ambulance for the Red Cross, whoopee. Uh, he doesn't even write to the King and Queen when Buckingham Palace was bombed. But he does move the American embassy or the, the ambassador's residence out of London. And everybody now is calling him Jittery Joe. It's, they feel that he's a coward. He's constantly saying that uh, the British are going to be defeated. He's opening his mouth all the time in ways that are highly insulting to everybody. And now that Churchill is actually the prime minister, um, and by the way, Joe never congratulated Joe. Uh, Joe never congratulated Churchill on becoming prime minister until. Roosevelt forced him to, and he only did that by telephone. Um, 
Joe is now living in Windsor, just on the outskirts of Windsor, claiming that his um, his home had been bombed, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it, it, there's proof now that that wasn't true. And here we have him coming out of the foreign office behind the standard sandbags in case of a bomb going off in front and shattering windows. He says his goodbyes um, in October, 1940, uh, 1940, he has made sure that he can leave. He has blackmailed Roosevelt into bringing him back before the 1940 election. Obviously, he's not going to be on the ticket. Um, and this is this is the major part of, of the story in the book. Um, he says his goodbyes and he returns to America. Within weeks of his leaving, Chamberlain dies. And of course, everybody now understands that if Britain falls, that it could be a terrible, terrible threat to America because if the Germans got hold of the um, British fleet, then the Atlantic would become a German sea. Kennedy, meanwhile, is forced into, by Roosevelt's cunning, is forced into backing Roosevelt for the 1940 um, election against his will. And there was a deal cut, but what the deal was, I don't think anybody will ever know for sure. Um, I believe Roosevelt said that he would either back Joe for 1944, or he would be sure to back Joe Jr. for the um, uh, senatorial race in 1940, sorry, 1944. But then of course, Pearl Harbor came and everything changed again. Joe had been going around America saying how much America can't get involved in a war, it's got nothing to do with us, et cetera, et cetera, just like Lindbergh had been doing. And of course, once Pearl Harbor was bombed, uh, Joe immediately sent a cable to Roosevelt, I'm yours to command, just name the place. Roosevelt never answered. Instead, what happened is the boys who'd always been competitive with one another, um, Jack had saved his crew um, from in PT-109 and that disaster. And so a few weeks after that, um, Joe Jr. decided he had to become the first drone pilot. And he took off from uh, the US Air Base in Norfolk in England. And um, the plane exploded about a minute later. Uh, his body and the body of his co-pilot were never found. Whoops. And that's basically the story. Although Kick finally does marry uh, Billy Hartington in 1943, but they were only married for three months before Billy was killed in action. There's a lot more to it, but you know, um, they're a fascinating family. Joe is quite an extraordinary character, both good and bad. Um, but the important thing to know is that he was adored by his children. Jack said when he was president, that he made everything possible. And you have to admire somebody who's adored by their adult children. Because I don't know many of us who are. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. Okay, great, thank you. It looks like we're getting some questions in, so don't forget they're gonna be at the QA at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so we have a few, so we'll start. Uh, there's a uh, question uh, from Janice that says, uh, the British public's initial affection for the Kennedy family later soured. What is the sentiment uh, today towards Joseph Kennedy? How is he remembered? It, it's interesting. A lot of my British friends, I said I was writing about him, um, didn't really know a lot about it. All they remembered from whatever they learned is that he was a bad man. That's what they said. Um, however, the Brits adored JFK. They adored Bobby. Um, it was as if something had happened to Britain when, when the two were assassinated. Um, same, I have to say the same of Martin Luther King as well. Um, it was a, a, the blackest period in, um, as far as the British were concerned in American history. Um, they, to this day, they all know where they were when those three incidents happened. So um, you can dislike the father, but you don't hold it against the sons. 
So you talked a little bit about this, about Neville Chamberlain and his opinion policy. Why was Joseph Kennedy so, for lack of a better term, interested in it? Why did you support that so much? Well, there, there were several reasons. Um, first of all, as a father of several sons, I think it's perfectly natural that he wouldn't want his sons to be fighting in a war, particularly in a war that he believed they would lose. Okay. Um, I think that is one of the main points. The second point is that um, I believe Joe Kennedy was a coward. As brave as his sons were, um, he comes across as a coward. Okay. And that's something that he tried to hide in all sorts of different ways. But the most important point is Joe Kennedy viewed politics through the lens of economics only. He viewed the world through economics only. And basically, war is bad for economics. It's bad for business. And that was the driving force that really pushed him too far. Um, that, that's, that's the main problem. Um, you know, for somebody who'd made three fortunes before he became ambassador, that's the way he thought. After he was ambassador, he never had another government appointment, but he made his biggest fortune yet investing in real estate. And who was his, his advisor? Cardinal Spellman. <laughs> so he knew, he, he knew how to make money. He just didn't know when not to talk. You talked a little bit about Charles Lindbergh and his mission to Germany, looking at their air force. Was there any sort of uh, dialogue or conversation between Joseph Kennedy and Lindbergh? Oh, oh yes. Um, they met at a lunch at the Astors and got on like a house on fire. And Joe continued with the friendship um, and called on, on Lindbergh quite a lot. Lindbergh thought that Joe was the most interesting politician that he had met. So there was a mutual affection between them and, and a mutual purpose by 1940. So um, they stayed in close touch, um, not as close as Lindbergh did with Henry Ford, um, but uh, they were like-minded individuals. And, and his report basically condemned any idea of fighting Hitler. It's basically just throw in the towel before you lose one human life, um, which was wrong. It was biased. Um, Lindbergh, uh, as you may or may not know, had a lot of psychological issues after um, his, uh, his son's kidnapping. Uh, they moved to Europe for three years. Um, he, after the war, he, he ended up marrying two German women and fathered two other families that his wife didn't know about um, on top of his other children that he'd had with his wife. So he had a lot of issues. Um, and I think that it's, um, it's fascinating uh, that he and Joe found like-minded, uh, like, the, like they were kindred spirits during this time. So I'm sure uh, the audience would like to know a little bit about your research. Um, is there anything interesting that you found out that surprised you or what was the process? Did you go any cool archives or record centers to find the information for this? Yeah, I mean, I did the usual, um, the uh, Library of Congress. Um, I have to say in, in the Library of Congress, the, the one thing that it has nothing to do with the book really was, was quite touching was I went through the Claire Booth Luce archive there as well, because she was such an important force uh, in Joe's life during the, the ambassadorship. And there's a letter, um, her, her only child, her daughter was killed in a, in a freak automobile accident when she was at Stanford University. And there's a letter from Jack Kennedy to Claire that is so tear stained, you can almost not read it. But it was a beautiful letter of condolence to her. And that to me, I thought was just worth, it was gold dust. But of course, it doesn't appear in the book because that's nothing to do with the book. Um, I also went to um, the National Archives at uh, College Park and to the Kennedy Library for quite a substantial period of time. Um, 
But the one thing that had surprised me is that no other uh, Joe Kennedy biographer had actually gone to the Royal Archives at Windsor, at Windsor Castle. And that's when I found loads of stuff, um, particularly about um, George VI, things that Kennedy had written to Roosevelt that he um, that he had set up on behalf of the U.S. government, like the uh, royal trip to America in 1939. All of that was was false, and so it was fascinating to read what the King of England was saying about Kennedy. And there's quite a bit of that towards the end of the book. So during the time when uh, Joseph Kennedy was the ambassador, did you look at the press of the British Empire and the American Empire? Was there a split between the two, or were they both really in love with Kennedy's family as opposed to his job? I'm not quite sure what the, the American Empire and the British Empire. The British oh, Empire sorry, was in Spain. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, um, uh, I guess I should have just said London in general, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, the British were had been told basically from the palace, be nice, be nice to Mr. Kennedy, okay? Yes, he's a Catholic, who cares? You know, yes, we are the bastion of Anglicanism, who cares? You know, be nice to Mr. Kennedy. And by and large, everybody behaved themselves, um, at least to his face. Um, and I think until Joe started to tell the British what they had to do, uh, when it wasn't his job to do that, they were they were willing to give him the benefit of the doubt on a number of things. The problem was that within two weeks of arriving, he had put the State Department's nose out of joint and he had put Roosevelt's nose out of joint. Um, the issue of empire was more of an issue between Roosevelt and um, Churchill not between Roosevelt and Chamberlain. Chamberlain was actually quite anti-American and Joe was unaware of that. Roosevelt knew, but Joe just didn't see it. So um, the, the empire discussion as it were, really was one that had to be accommodated in America helping Britain once, um, Churchill had become prime minister in 1940. You mentioned this a little bit in your book about uh, Joseph Kennedy not being qualified for the job. However, um, this is sort of speculation, but do you think maybe he was given the job, even though he wasn't qualified to sort of get him out of FDR's hair? Oh, definitely. Um, when I said, you know, that there was a two month delay, um, you know, there's, there's the old saying, be careful what you wish for. Uh, Joe had decided this was his leg up and he would become either vice president or presidential candidate in 1940. Who ever heard of an American president running three times? Goodness, much less four times, uh, which of course Roosevelt did and won. So um, Kennedy was on the make, okay? And, and it was very, very difficult for Roosevelt to take this. In addition, he was an isolationist for uh, in, in the strongest sense of the term, and he was a troublemaker. He was going behind talking to senators behind the, uh, Roosevelt's back, trying to stop things from happening. And there's no doubt that he was that he agreed to the London posting because he, he would be less of a danger overseas than he was in Washington. And this was essentially what Claire Booth Luce told him. You got to come back regularly. You got to you got to keep keep your face in the, in the press in America. She was right, but that wasn't his job. His job was to translate to the State Department and to the president at the White House what was going on, what was the feeling about America. You know what? Uh, you know when when um, uh, Churchill said, "If we're invaded and we have to go into exile, we're going to take the government to Canada." I mean, there were palpitations. At Kennedy, he didn't write anything though about it to Roosevelt. So he he didn't have a diplomatic bone in his body. Uh, he had a lot of other attributes and a, a tremendous failings, but he was not a diplomat. And Roosevelt knew that, but he also knew that he could spread his own network, which he did, 
very successfully, if needs be, and keep Joe out of harm's way in London. So, um, but the crucial period um, that Roosevelt worked on was from December 1937 to February um, 1938. And because that was also a very crucial period for this, this huge trade agreement, which of course, Joe ended up not being involved in at all, but that was the reason for sending him over to, to London. So yeah, there's, that's, that's a major part of the book. So I have a question. I read something in there called the Kennedy Plan. I think I have it right. Can you talk a little bit about that? And was it ultimately <laughs> successful? Well, the Kennedy Plan wasn't the Kennedy Plan. Um, it was the work of the Intergovernmental uh, Committee on uh, Refugees. And it was about the resettlement of Jews and the political um, enemies of Hitler overseas, basically. And um, one of the biggest problems was America didn't want to take any. Um, but in addition to that, um, you know, they were going to put some in Belize and they were going to put some others in Guyana, British Guyana. Of course, the uh, Zionist movement at the time wanted them to go to Palestine. Um, you know, so there was there, everybody wanted to find a solution. Except. Hitler. And there's 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 this wonderful um, argument that had happened in Britain some years ago now, where some uh, where uh, the former mayor of London said, oh, Hitler was a Zionist. He was trying to put um, the Jews into Palestine. Well, Hitler wasn't a Zionist. He wasn't trying to put the Jews into Palestine. And there is a big part of the book that actually describes, well, not a big part, it's Jack's understanding of JFK's understanding of why the Palestinian problem at the time was so bad. And, and he, he did it in just a few sentences. And I quote him in the book about it. But essentially, the British Empire had taken on the Palestinian mandate um, against its will. It was given to, to Britain by um, the League of Nations. And the League of Nations, and basically, Britain promised the Arabs one thing with something called the McMahon Agreement, and it promised the Jews another thing with the Balfour Agreement. So, you know, chaos, total chaos. But Jack is the only person who saw this clearly. And you come away from the book loving this young man saying, wow, what a mind, you know? Yes, he had, he had terrible faults too, but he had, he had a real understanding as an internationalist. Joe wasn't an internationalist, but the Kennedy plan was essentially what the intergovernmental, uh, sorry, the intergovernmental committee was trying to do to resolve the, the Jewish and um, refugee problem. And he stole it, and he, he should be ashamed. <laughs> OK, we have time for one last question, because I know it's getting late over there. <laughs> so uh, Ryan <laughs> asked, how did Joe react to JFK's book, While England Slept? Oh, he was very involved in the editing of the book. Um, and it's the only time that he tries, he tries to get lots of people to read it and to comment on it. And there's, there are a number of letters backwards and forwards between them about putting the emphasis someplace else and maybe you should do this, that, or the other. But at the end of the day, it was Arthur Kroc who really helped Jack edit the book better than anybody. And, and he did a very good job. Okay, well, I know it's getting late, so we do thank you so much for your wonderful presentation over there. Thank you. Um, Thank you, everybody, for, for listening. <laughs> thank you so much again, Susan. And thanks for everybody out there to the Hudson Library. Have a wonderful night and um, good night. <laughs> thank you very much. Take care thank now. You.